Building Information Modeling, or BIM for short, is a wonderful tool to create great architecture. Unfortunately, many might believe that BIM is out of their reach. This is because adapting from 2D drafting to BIM might seem time-consuming and costly. Also, it seems that BIM means a whole new workflow and methods which you need to learn from scratch, and the new requirements and legislations may seem too complicated to follow. Our mission behind ArchLine is to open a gateway to BIM. ArchLine makes the transition from 2D drafting to BIM step by step. It takes you from 2D to 3D modeling and introduces BIM parameters to your workflow. Sharing your projects with other professionals is effortless. The software makes sure that you can use your already existing CAD skills, files and projects to stay competitive. The gate is now open for new challenges and previously unavailable projects. ArchLine is an out-of-the-box IFC certified BIM software. No extra plugins are needed to complete your project because your design will contain everything in a single file. You will work together with other parties of the building industry seamlessly. Avoid misunderstandings. Use real products. Collaborate better than before. BIM is quickly becoming the standard. Make sure you are there with ArchLine. Hello from lovely Budapest. My name is Zoltán Tóth and this is our resident architect, Mr. Ülés Pap. Hi there. Uh, this is the second episode of our um, Gateway to BIM webinar series. Uh, for those of you who didn't listen in uh, last time, we, we looked at the basic architectural features of our interior design and architecture um, software, ArchLine, and we looked at how to create a two-story family building, uh, family dwelling in our software. Now is the second part of the story, how to use external data. More often than not, as far as we understand, um, <coughs> professionals work with existing data. So it, it does happen that you work on buildings from scratch, but more often than not, you have some kind of external data to rely on. This can be Many floor times, plans, yeah. that's right, 3D objects you already Scan have. Scan drawing sometimes. That's right. So we decided to devote the second part of our webinar series uh, to how to process this kind of uh, data and how to work with them. Like I said, this is the second part of the five-part webinar series. We are going to look at some documentation and uh, and interior and the design tools later on. But now we are going to look at how to how the data gets into the software. That being said, uh, this project, what I'm showing you, might be familiar to you. That's where we sort of that's where we left off, right? Yeah. So what we are going to talk about now is how to get data into the system. But that boils down to what kind of file types we are able to import, right? Yes, uh, actually uh, ArchLine is uh, intentionally designed to be an open uh, platform. Of course, uh, ArchLine has its own file format, but it is uh, widely open for input and, uh, and also you can export your data uh, to several file formats. I think this diagram shows that uh, very well that ArchLine communicates um, seam seamlessly as much as possible in IFC, in DXF, DWG files, Revit files, and so on. As you can see, this chart shows several different type of file formats, 2D, 3D, and of course, also information that you can pass to, for example, 3D renders, or if you just would like to uh, make your uh, document as a PDF file, or you would like to extract your data in an, in an Excel file to make further calculations, that's also uh, always possible. Um, Anything to add here? <coughs> Just one thing to add. Um, I think in the during the first uh, webinar, we all also pushed this this topic very very far. That uh, when it comes to working together with other software products, we are trying to pursue the the policy that we rather work with them instead of you know competing with them because. There are two scenarios as far as I see. You either work together with other co-designers who might work in other software products, yeah. but sometimes you don't work with co-designers, but at, at the same time, when you're doing one project, sometimes you use several applications and several software products. Maybe you already have a <coughs> um, rendering engine, or maybe you already have a modeler. So and you very likely this. you will have to work with other professionals, of course, when and then it's necessary to be able to open their files and to be able to process that data mm -hmm. as much lossless as it's possible. That's right. Obviously, we are not <coughs> going to have enough time to cover all these uh, import and export formats, but we are going to look at a typical workflow. That means uh, importing a scanned uh, 
so it's a, a scanned uh, image or PDF yeah. for floor plan and work with them. Actually, today in today's uh, lesson, at, at least at the beginning of this uh, webinar, we will focus on file types that we, we understand the, the most widely used uh, file formats uh, in communication. And a few of them uh, we will actually talk about in detail. Uh, we will use this uh, project uh, as a platform, uh, as, a, as, a, as a basis uh, for our work uh, today. Uh, but before we do that, uh, let me show you where you can find these, um, these tools that you can use yes. for importing file formats. Now, there is one interesting thing uh, that I should start with, that even if you do not know where this file import command is, you can actually drag and drop any sort of file into ArchLine and this drag and drop import is by default supported and all those file formats that ArchLine supports will automatically handle. So if you have a PDF file and you would like to process it in ArchLine, just drag and drop it over the drawing surface and then ArchLine will recognize it. But other than that, you can actually go and find a file import and all these, these are actually dedicated file formats. This is, these are not all the file formats that you can import. These most are the most exposed. Used. Yeah, here, at, at least on the interface. But if you would like to find all the file formats, you just go with the import tool and then you open up this uh, filter here and then you will be able to find all the file formats that uh, Archline can uh, import and handle uh, in several ways. Now, for example, if we would like to import scanned data, for that, we would like to uh, import a JPEG file. Now, a JPEG file will be always a raster content uh, which is um, it's because it's a, it's a raster file and it's and it's you know it's containing uh, dots uh, the, the colored dots um, yes. of the raster image and then you can import that and you can use it as an um, like an underlay uh, below your real drawing and you can you can work on top of it for the, for that you can calibrate that uh, JPEG file and then after calibration uh, you can work with it. Uh, now, what I would like to show you is another file format which is uh, quite similar uh, in, in how much common that file format is, and that's the PDF. A PDF file can be processed at least two ways. Uh, one is, uh, it can be also a raster-based PDF. Let me open one here so I can show you the difference. If uh, I open uh, this, for example, here, this is actually a PDF file, as you can see, it's, it's my situation plan PDF uh, saved on my computer. And this uh, contains a, a situation plan with the surrounding that we will uh, today process in this uh, design. And if I zoom in, uh, then it reveals that it actually, after a certain point, it is breaking mm -hmm. up to pixels. And that's how you determine that your PDF file is either uh, raster based or vector based. Now, if this would be vector based, we can see, we, we will be able to see these we'll clearly, like zoom clear in image. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but this is not what happens. It, it, it's, it's like a photograph. And actually, this PDF was created with a scanner. This was a printed uh, drawing and we scanned it, and this is how it looks like. But what's, yeah. the, what's the difference uh, in terms of processing between uh, vector-based and, and raster images? So no. when it comes to <coughs> line, uh, how, how would, would you need to do things differently? I think I can show you this first. Let's see. I will open, uh, open up this first in a new project because that's a, that's a, a likely scenario that you would like to start with an existing drawing, that's a, which is a PDF. You open up a new project. You either set up this or you just say, OK, and you do, you do it later. And then you go to File import and you choose PDF as image because now we know that's mm -hmm. an image. If you choose PDF as an image and then you go there and find this library, let me just quickly find it, it's on the computer, uh, it's on, in our webinar series, this here and that's today's lesson import and this one. So when I open up this, pro this one, uh, it will actually start with a resolution. Uh, mm -hmm. The PDF itself has a certain resolution but the way I will handle, I can further scale it down or uh, I, I can overscale it, but it's not, not, not meaningful in case uh, I have a lower resolution source. But anyway, I usually go with the, with the basic resolution, the, the default resolution, because sometimes I just can't decide which one. So I just go with this one. Uh, actually here, 
here are the possibilities, but I usually go with this uh, second one, uh, the third one, and I go OK. And then I can place this uh, raster image by its two points. Yes, but and now it's it's not in scale. And as you can see, that I could literally pick up uh, pick any sort of two points in this drawing, and it could be smaller, larger. Say I I don't know uh, what's the size, and uh, there is actually. Uh, unfortunately, there is no information in these uh, PDF files usually what the original size is, especially that's an image. So there's there's no real world size. So well, you need to calibrate it. There are some measurements it. on it, yeah. so maybe you can use them. Yeah, so uh, we have the luck to see these and mostly we will have. Uh, so I can actually just right click here and select calibrate. And then knowing the longest value, I will pick the f starting point and I'm actually working in meters now, so I will use the same value. I click here, and then I can type uh, 24.7. Yes. And enter. And now it's, mm -hmm. it's scaled up. It's scaled up. So now if I zoom out, and then I measure this distance with the real measure tool, like for example this here, actually it's from the dimension measure and distance. So I just, uh, I will try to pick up the, the same two points. Actually, it's not really possible, actually, because, uh, it you know, it's, another, uh, yes. it's not snapping. But uh, if I have only a few centimeters difference, that's good enough. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's almost there. It's quite good. So, so this is how you handle this data. And then, then you will literally work on top of it. You will mm -hmm. just draw so things on top of it. So you use this as an underlay, and then you recreate what you want to do on <coughs> above it, just above it, yes. it's a 3D model. Okay, what happens if you have a vector-based um, entity? If you have the vector-based uh, entity, now I just removed that, then you use the other option. Uh, it's an import and PDF as geometry. And then I, uh, well, I, this time I cannot use this one because this has no geometrical data. This has no geometric information. It only has a one raster image and that cannot be processed this way. So I select another one. And before I do that, let me reveal what it contains. So if I go back here, this is uh, the other PDF here. Mm -hmm. And it's actually a different drawing. Uh, but if I zoom in here, I can see that perhaps when I'm it's zooming, always. it's pixelated. But when I stop, it clears up, always. Yes, it's, it's always going to be sharp. So it's sharp, always. That's, that's uh, you can what see this better on the angular lines. Yeah, that's how you can determine that this is actually a a geometric uh, called data, a geometric PDF. So what it contains are literally lines and sometimes text and things that you can handle in a CAD software. It's not a mm -hmm. not a, a, a JPEG data. So um, I minimize it and I open up it in ArchLine, and then it's already starting up with the import of this file. So it needs to process, but the but the good <coughs> thing about this PDF is going to be that the lines are recognized, and that uh, that means that there are certain <coughs> dedicated tools that we can use to turn this into a three-dimensional. Uh, <coughs> yes, that's right. So when you when you do that, you can actually say okay, and then you can have this data. This is this is the same content. If you zoom in, you will see that this is the lines and everything. Uh, one thing that you cannot be certain uh, about without measuring it again its size whether it's uh, mm -hmm. good or not because you know this can be scaled in this specific case this is actually scaled I think in 1 to 20 or something like that so what I need to do before I start processing it is I actually measure it again I use this tool I like this uh, because it it has no trace it, it leaves no trace behind it's just you know literally measures two points that you pick and then I can see that, it's well, this is small. rather small. So <coughs> I need to select this content. This is what I do. And then I can select the edit. And there is a tool called move, and it contains uh, a tool which is for scaling. So I will use, uh, I will multiply it with 100. So I would like to see something that is 100 times larger than this one. And I believe that will be better. But then uh, if I check, actually, at the right bottom corner, there is the information about how, uh, how it is scaled. I will see if it's OK or not. And then I can actually pick up uh, a custom value as well. And that's what I will do then. So as you can see, uh, perhaps I further 
uh, I think we further shrink further it. shrunk it, maybe it's even anyway, smaller. Yeah. Uh, one thing to point out here is that obviously, as, as we did any other images, for instance, you can crop these. So yeah, you I can actually further shrink it. So yes. uh, shrunk it. So actually, uh, this is how you can process this co this content. You can uh, shrink it or rescale it, but. Anyhow, when you realize that the, that the size is not good, you can either undo it and do it again, or you can say that you would like to use a certain scale on your own, which is, for example, edit uh, scale, and you just use the scale too. So you don't use the predefined mm -hmm. values, but you, instead of that, you just use something else. Yes. Once we scale, <coughs> it, uh, how can we process this? Because obviously we could we could trace it over that yeah. that's one solution, but there's another tool what could be used to turn these into a three-dimensional smart objects. Yeah, if this is uh, proper scaled, then uh, you will be able. Let me just quickly scale it because uh, now if I use the wall tool, it will be very tiny. And uh, so let me just use the other value. It's um, this one here. Uh, so once it's scaled, there is the tool which is also useful on DWG files because actually when you load a DWG file, which we will do soon, uh, you can uh, decide how you scale that information and then it also um, ends with lines and circles and things like that. And then based on the information, there is the tool, wall tool, which is called walls on DWG file. Let me just zoom out and then I will use the, that tool here and um, with that, this one, yes. I will pick one endpoint around uh, the endpoint and around the other endpoint I click and then the software recognizes the line itself. And then I click on the other line which represents the, the thickness of the wall and then it will turn it automatically into a wall. So this way you can quick process uh, walls, you can quick process even doors, doors and, windows and windows because there is this door by two points and window by two points. So you literally just pick two points on your drawing and then it will build up it That's in right. 3D. You mentioned the DWG import. So why don't we look at an example <coughs> of that? Uh, yeah, let's see that. I, I think uh, today's uh, session is about uh, also terrain. So I yes. will load up a terrain um, outline in this case. Uh, Archline handles terrains many ways. This is one of the simplest when you do not have 3D data in the DXF file or you don't have you know, point clouds or something like that. Archline also supports those. But when you have the, the, the simplest situation, when you only have a line drawing with, with, with literally texts on it, and uh, Archline can handle that as well. So I opened up a new project, <coughs> and then I go to File, Import, and DWG, or I open up the same thing. Let me just open up my browser, and... Uh, you can just drag and drop it, It's right? here, yeah. That's it. So I will just use this DWG file and drag and drop it over Archline. Let me just remove that. And okay, then let's, let's stop here <coughs> for a second. As you mentioned, the DWG drawings sometimes they, they don't carry their scaling with them. So yeah. how do you know which one is the right scaling? I actually don't. <laughs> that's the, that's so the point. What do you do? <laughs> Mostly you don't know what the scale of this that drawing is because you are not the source. You are not the one who created it. So it's uh, you, sometimes uh, for the newcomers, this dialogue is like, oh, I don't, I cannot answer. Don't worry, I, I, me, not, me neither. I, I usually import the data like I do now, and I click OK, and then when I see the data, I check the size mm -hmm. again, just so as we did a before, to see if and it then makes I sense. zoom in so I can see that okay, again, this is a hundred times smaller than what it should be. So I hit Escape. I select the, the whole content and then I use the same tool again, edit, move and scale and then I would like to make it 100 times larger than the original one or 1000 or times because in this case we need to use this value and then it scales it, we can see it's, it's actually larger and when I click here now I should see something of a much better value than it was originally. Perfect, so now <coughs> we are going to I assume we are going to turn this into a, a terrain, but before yeah. we do that, there's a couple of things to talk about regarding the DWG. I think this, this might be trivial for some of you, but this drawing comes with its layers, right? Yeah. So one, one thing that we have here, we, don't, we not only have the, the drawing itself, but we also have the layers with, with it. Yeah. What Arshine does <coughs> is that it groups together the layers that were imported within the drawing, so you have them packaged separately. And yeah. this is a very useful tool because we are going to later on isolate a few parts of the drawing and work with them only. 
But one thing to take away from here is that all the layers coming with the drawings are going to be uh, stored <coughs> separately. That's right. Uh, when you load uh, a DWG file, as you mentioned, Archline automatically creates uh, layer groups or layer filters. Uh, these are the layer uh, groups here. And by default, if you don't do anything, you just open up a new project and you start working with it and you do not import anything, you will have at least the all layers and the use layers uh, filter. And now we have one uh, called situation plan. And the reason it is named like that is because this uh, filter, this, this layer group, inherited uh, the name of the DWG file. So it's a quick filter uh, automatically grouping the original uh, D DWG files layers into this new group so you can easily filter them out because later at a later stage likely I would like to hide it and I mm -hmm. would like to represent only my data or I need to use it for other purposes. So this uh, group is automatically created but actually at any time if you want you can create a new group or you can e erase existing groups this is literally just filtering, so you won't erase the layers in it, you just uh, erase the filter itself. If you add further details to a drawing, let's say holes, slabs, roofs, etc., where are those? Where are these elements going to be stored? These are all, all, always automatically at the all and the use layers, and, and if you would like to do otherwise, like I would like to put this into the new group, I need to drag and drop it into that mm -hmm. group, or, or I can do it with a multi-selection um, that works as well. So, so these so. are actually uh, CAD uh, conventions, I would say. So the, yeah. the way Arstein handles layers is very similar to how other CAD softwares are doing this, because these are the industry standards, I would, I would say. Yeah, so we can see now in this um, file, in this DWG file, there were four layers. Uh, one for the ground, one for points, one for walls, and one for uh, the terrain lines. And this I can already use for my benefit uh, when I would like to uh, filter to see only the terrain lines. I will load up the layer walk tool with which I can easily figure out which is which, and mm -hmm. then I can focus only on this one. But before I do that, let me just rotate this drawing a little bit because uh, this is the, the the land, the site that we, we will work on and I would like to use this as a horizontal wall uh, on my design and for that I would like to rotate this uh, this drawing. Before we do, uh, can we some, somehow record the north direction because that's going to be valuable information for your purposes. So Yes, that's right, that's right. Uh, when you import a uh, DWG file, you, you can have two options. You will have likely two options. First, you can receive a DWG file which is like, you know, XY uh, oriented, not, not, not north oriented. This is north oriented. Uh, so when you have that and you would like to convert it into the uh, regular XY uh, conversion or, or coordinate system, then you can just select this content and then you can rotate it. But before, as you mentioned, to, to not to lose where the original north was, I usually use this uh, drafting tool and there is the line, the regular line, and there is actually one with the narrow head, which is, which is great because this will indicate the north direction to me. So you just draw one. I literally just draw a line with a an, with an pointing arrow on it. And then I will select these whole things, all the drawings, and then I rotate this. Now, I could rotate it freely, but in this case, it's much better to use the rotate from option because I would like to p place a reference point here, which is, this will be ro the rotation origin. And then I will pick up this point, this is which I grab. And as you can see, now when I move the mouse, I can just set up the new direction. And again, as we mentioned in an earlier uh, session, if you move your mouse to the horizontal direction and you hold the shift key, you can lock the horizontal mm -hmm. direction. So this time, I can make sure that this rotation will end up with the horizontal uh, wall line here. So and I just, just click at that. that just click, yeah, the and that's control. it. So now it's um, rotated. And I also kept the north direction, which we will get back to later on. And then now I can process this data. So to clear it up, because now I don't want to see everything, I just would like to see these lines. I go back to the uh, layer walk. And as you, as you can see here, now this button, this is, this is actually like a learning menu. This learned that the, la the latest used command was the layer walk. So I don't even have to open it and, and select it. I can just click on the button itself and then it comes up with the terrain lines and, and, and all the rest, and I can select this one, and then I can start processing it. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how <coughs> to process this and how to make this into a, into a terrain. Uh, this is a two-dimensional DXF, right? 
It's a, yeah, to the uh, two dimensional. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We are able to import three dimensional as well, but this is going to be a 2D. So, what mm -hmm. you are going to do now, you, are, you will use these terrain lines and then the numbers on top to turn this into a three dimensional model. Yeah, yeah. These are the lines that the original designer set this here uh, to, to make me understand that that's the uh, 133.5 mm -hmm. meters above the sea level. So, I will use this. Uh, values. Why don't you start the process, explain how you start, and then while you do it, I'll, I'll tell more about the terrain tools. Yeah, okay, B before I do that, uh, let me just show you that actually the, all the terrain tools, the, the, the terrain related tools are here. Uh, this is what, we, what you will cover uh, yes. a little bit uh, further in detail. And when you would like to process the terrain data manually based on a drawing, you will go with this option. Other than that, you can you can load a file which contains the X Y Z uh, co coordinates. Then you can work with that. But uh, if you have a drawing like this, like a two D two D drawing, which you would like to manually process, then you will go with this option. So I start with this one, and then I select this by open chain. These here, these are what we call open chains. These this is a series, a chain of lines, like a polyline, like a polyline. And then if I use this, I can actually simply click on one of them, like this here, and, then, and I just type the same value that I can see there. It's 133.5, mm -hmm. enter. enter. And then now the software turned it into a, a terrain yeah. line, and then I can keep going on Perfect. and processing this data. Perfect. Meanwhile, while you, while you do this, I'll uh, entertain the viewers with some fun facts about the terrain. Okay. So as you are going to see in a couple of minutes, the Arschline terrains are going to be a three-dimensional morphs, like bodies. If you want to add any kind of plateaus, roads, or any kind of protrusion onto this terrain, you first have to generate it. So you are going to end up with one solid to which you can add additional tools. These tools can be, for instance, building volumes, which are very good for shadow analysis. We are going to see that later on. You can add additional parts to it. You can make uh, ditches into that. You can change the pitch, uh, the, the pitch of, the, of the cutouts. And eventually, you will have a terrain which has multiple um, portrayal options. You, would, you could have uh, level lines. You could have a triangulated form. Any, any, and any, grid. Any, mm -hmm. uh, yes, grid. That was the word I was looking for. Any kind of uh, portrayal mode. Once you are done with setting up the terrain lines, now nothing happens so far. <laughs> so yeah. what do we have to do to, to generate this input? Yeah, to tell the software that I'm actually done with the selection and I don't want to keep going on and select more and more and more lines. Just as in other cases when you are in a loop like this, you can instruct the software to finish it by just hitting the enter key. And then the software uh, finishes it. It's um, Sorry, I was on the other, other screen. So you just hit uh, enter, and then you have the terrain. But to be able to visualize it, see it yet. So uh, that's because of uh, because of yeah. the layer walk, as you remember. Yeah. We disabled a couple of things from our drawing, including yeah. the terrain itself. Yeah, yeah. So even even if I click here to build up the 3D, I won't see anything. So I need to go back here and find it. Ah, okay. So there's the terrain. That's the terrain. That's right. I actually turn on everything yes. now. And then I use it and I click hammer again. 3D hammer, and then now I have and it. You end up with the, with the morph. Remember what I mentioned, mentioned before, now you have one body on, on which yeah. you can add additional things. One of these things is, uh, is actually that, that, that cutout or plateau. <coughs> what we are, you could, what you, what, yes, these are the different uh, representation styles. Yeah. We uh, well, actually, the plateau is, um, is, 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 is like a flat ground, as you mentioned. That's, that will be the uh, that could be used for many things. Now, in this case, we will use it as a as a as a plateau for our building itself. So that is the area that should be flattened here, and uh, for that, I will use the terrain. And there's the uh, plateau tool, and I would like to first add a new plateau. So if I do that, I need to click on the terrain itself, and then draw this area around. But now we are lucky enough uh, not to have to do that. But instead of that, uh, we can actually uh, select an existing item. That existing item is the hatch here that we can use. So I just click on select an item, and I click there, and the software recognized the contour of the hatch. This is literally like a hatch. If you, some of them uh, uh, out there, you are fam more familiar with these uh, terms, I, but they call it fills in other software, which is filling the, filling the area with some certain pattern. So that's what I did. I selected this pattern, and then now I need to set up the level line, uh, the elevation of this flat ground. And that for that, I will actually use this value here. Uh, that was uh, decided to be 134.6. 
above sea level and enter. And then at the next step, I need to set up what will be the inclination of this uh, side. For all this, the sides, right? For all the sides. Right? Now, we, we are certain that this is not 100% uh, overlapping the terrain, but instead of that, somewhere it will be raised above the terrain and some, somewhere it will be cut into the terrain. So when I instruct the software to use 45 degree angle for this cut, then this is what will happen. The software either uh, cuts it into the ground mm -hmm. in 45 degree angle, or sometimes it will ex actually extend the terrain with the necessary amount of uh, soil or whatever happens below this um, Mm, plateau. Yes, but on this side, I'm pretty sure that it's going to, it's not going to be 45 degrees. Yes, in this case, we need to uh, build up a, a wall over there, a vertical wall. So in cases like this, you can actually go back to the 2D, or this can be done as well in the 3D. And then when you click on that side, this is this is one of them which I would like to turn uh, vertical. So I right click here, I find the terrain using this jump menu here. And then here I can find modify slope on this side. And then now the slope itself is 45 degree angle. So I need to go back to zero. Zero in this case means vertical. So I click on OK. And then I click on mm -hmm. so you this one. So just have to select the size which you need to modify. Okay. And then just click add the zero value. Zero. Hit enter. And okay. So I, this step I repeat as much as I need. And when I'm done, I just hit enter, so the software creates the new cut, and then that's what I end up with. How about that wall piece that you have to draw in? Yeah, this wall piece, uh, will that, this, this will be a, a, a regular wall, so I will just go and use the wall tool, and I can use any the of style. these <laughs> styles. Yeah, I, I think I will go with the default style now, but of course I can create a new style for only for this concrete wall or something like that, or I can select an existing concrete wall. So what I do, I just select uh, these points and I start drawing it. And some of them, some of you maybe already re realize what's the, what's the trouble here. A problem here is that the 2D is correct, but the 3D is not correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, why is that? Let me just enlarge that so to see we can see it much better. Why is that? It's because when you created the terrain, uh, you, you instructed the software, I actually did that. To, to, to instruct the software to, to put these level lines 100, more than 100 meters above the sea level. But I didn't do the same thing with the building itself. I didn't tell the software where the building is. Uh, simply creating a plateau won't do that because you can have multiple plateaus. So you need to go back to the 2D and check the floor settings, the, the story settings, the building settings. And then here is the value that you need to change. And now it's zero, so that means our uh, building uh, zero is at the sea level. So, so this is what I need same, to... Uh, uh, I, think, I think it's not building. Ah, yeah, sorry. So, so you have to add the same value as you did with the plateau, right? Yeah. I just use the same value. Mm -hmm. And then when it's done, okay. And then, see, it's still not changed, changed but it's, it's for the same reason why sometimes Archline uh, needs you to, to tell it that you now you need to refresh the 3D model. So you just initiate that and then the software will update the 3D as well. Perfect. So that's that's one thing to take away from me, uh, here. What we mentioned last time is that the 3D is not going to be refreshed all the time in certain situations. You have to do that manually, but that's yeah. usually to, to conserve brain power. One thing to, I think, to discuss at this point is uh, we talked about the north sign and the north direction. How about the rest of geolocation? How can we position this project on the, on the globe? Uh, for or, that, or why would we do that? But let me ask you this way. Uh, first things first, uh, you can do it for, for multiple reasons, but the, one of the strongest ideas here is that if you would like to make a shadow analysis, for that, of course, you need to know where your building is on, on, on the globe. And we are even not speaking about energetic calculations, because for that as well, you will need the same information. Uh, so there are many reasons uh, to do that. and. The ways you can do that uh, is also at least two or three three places in the software where you can do it. Do it. It's, uh, first things first. If you simply only would like to set up the north direction, which is actually represented at the bottom of the screen, you can just simply click on this one, set up a new north direction, which is parallel to the one that you, that I actually designed, or I can I can actually use the proper value because now I need, I know that it's it should be this one. Uh, 
So I say okay, and then now the real north direction, the building is north, north direction, is pointing to the same direction than the drawing uh, dry, uh, north direction was pointing to. Uh, that's only the north direction. This can be found as well in file, BIM, and project parameters. You know, this is the place where you can fill up all the data at any time and you can just customize and change them continuously. And that's where you can also find the project location. So if you actually click here and you click on set north direction, that will do the same thing the that, same that happened here. Prompted. Now, if I would like to, I can go to the predefined city list and set up a city from this list if I have the luck to, to, to design into any of these cities and say OK. But if it's uh, like a smaller city which is not in the large city list, uh, then I can simply go and find that location on Google Maps. So this is what I do now. I go to Google Maps. And then when it comes up, I need to set up this position somewhere uh, where it should be. Now, for, for that, I need to select a land. I need to type um, an address. And this time, well, this will be. This building is going to be standing. So This time, it will be this building, I mean, uh, this uh, city. A city address and this should be that land okay. over here mm -hmm. it's so an empty land manually um, move the marker now if you want yeah and what i need to do now um this text means satellite so i click on satellite view and then i can see that there is an empty land here and then i just move this marker to where i would like to set up my project origin to and this is how the software will be able to align your uh, site, uh, your building with the site. Uh, we actually have uh, a much more detailed workshop of, uh, about this. Yes. A uh, much more detailed we webinar have, about have this. Covered, but we thought that this, this might be a good place to cover this here as well, yeah, because so, for the shadow analysis, this is going to be. Yeah, so uh, if you would like to learn more about this, uh, we will copy the link of that uh, video um, in, this, um, in this session and you will be able to learn about that. But for this time, it's enough. We have set up the location of the building itself, and that's good enough uh, so that we can uh, make a shadow analysis uh, of this building. So, okay, and then um, we will make the shadow analysis. But before we do that, uh, I would like to show you another tool. Now, this is the place where we will build up our building. So obviously yes. that building will have some shape uh, so sooner or later. Uh, but what we are also interested in is how this building affects with its shadow the neighboring buildings and the other lands. And vice versa. And vice versa. Of course, we, are, we would also like to know how the, the, the surrounding buildings will affect our building. So for that, we somehow need to uh, somehow sketch at least these building shapes here and turn them into buildings. Uh, well, we could use the wall tool to build up, build them up, but that's just uh, that's just uh, like a cannon shot for for this this uh, mm -hmm. topic. And what we need to do is uh, instead of that, I use the terrain, and there is the building volume. Yes, that's that's something that I already mentioned. This would be the tool to <coughs> to create uh, one solid body to represent the building because. For neighboring buildings or buildings for, for uh, shadow analysis, you don't need to have elaborate uh, structures. You just want to yeah, have the mass. Yeah, we only need to the, the, the bounding, the, the surrounding uh, structure and also the, the, the roof inclination. But that's, that's also not that much important to be exact. Well, in some, some areas, it's important. In that case, you can, you can uh, use the same. But if it's not that much important, you can just quick sketch something as yes. well. So it's, it's good for both purposes. Now I will use a value like uh, this, for example, uh, rather um, regular building shape. And then I use the same for all sides. And for example, on this side, I just would like to use a vertical cut. And for example, on this side, I use a vertical cut as well. So we, I just have a regular building model like this here. And when I click OK, it's over there. And the same thing I quickly repeat here, the same tool, um, building volume. You just copy the, uh, the footprint of the building. Yeah, well, actually what I could do, I could actually simply select this one, move it around. Yeah, provided here, that they are the same. And then I can just simply, you know, reshape it. So either way it works. Which I can just simply start 
uh, with, a, with a default shape or I can just customize the existing shape. So now I have two buildings. But as you can see, now again, we have a problem with the positioning because we didn't know where they land. So they actually landed on the same plateau. That's the same level where all but these levels. That's because you, you elevated the, the <coughs> project's base elevation to yeah. 134, I think. So all the buildings are around are copying that uh, value, right? Yeah, so now the project zero is at this level, which is fine. It's, it's fine for these buildings as well by default. But when I would like to move them to the proper position, I need to know where this uh, height is. There is a tool to ask for a certain uh, elevation height on the, of, the, of the terrain. But in this case, it's much better and easier if, I, if you just simply select this um, model and you just move it until you see it touches mm -hmm. the ground. So just uh, approximately... <coughs> and, the same, yeah, and the same thing and happens here. This. So I just elevate it to this point when it's, when it's just coming out. Okay, so you have the building masses <coughs> now. How do you create a shadow, shadow analysis? Now the shadow analysis uh, always uh, performed in the 3D. And when you do that, you need to go to view and there is this shadow and there's this solar access. But before that, you can also make a, a, a graphical shadow analysis, like a manual shadow analysis, and that's called a shadow simulation. With this shadow simulation, the software actually casts uh, some sunlight on this model and it uh, uh, represents the shadows themselves at a certain time. And you can set up a customized time and the time of the <laughs> year, of course. And yeah, well, actually, and you can day. play it uh, mm -hmm. kind of real time uh, or, or, you know, you just move the slider and you can set up any sort of position and easily determine how this affects. So now, actually, we can see that this building is not necessarily casting any shadows on this, uh, in this, on this land in September, but perhaps it will do in October, mm -hmm. as you can see. So you can also change the date to check how it will affect the building itself. So now let's use something like this. So it, it actually depends on, on, uh, on the local regulations on which date you need to make the, the shadow analysis. You set up that date and then you go and find the shadow, uh, sorry, the, the solar access, which will actually create a drawing. It's, it's already telling me that it in image mode, which where, where we are now, it's not possible, so it's actually turning the drawing into drawing mode. And then I can set up the date, or I just check it, the starting and the ending time, the steps. This is These are the steps of the, the times the shadow will be cast, and uh, it will so be also represented. every 30 minutes, there's going to be one, <coughs> one step. In this yeah, you can make drawing. it uh, shorter or, or, or longer. It's, it's, it's again, uh, local regulation. Then you can set up the start color and the end color for that day. <coughs> that will be the shadow contour. And especially if you set up this setting here that you would like to see not just the shadow contour lines, but also the hatch inside. And you can go with a solid pattern, which, which will be like a, a, a color a solid fill. I would like to see something like this, so only hidden lines. And then I would like to use it for all the, all the content, which I can see here, because now I don't have many surfaces. If I have many surfaces, I will use this uh, option. So the software will only calculate the shadow uh, on, on selected surfaces. But if uh, it's not that case, then I just disable this option and then and I hit OK. And this is how it works then. Mm -hmm. So perfect. It, it draws out <coughs> the, uh, the path of the shadows based on the two colors that you designated. Yeah, so we can see that this building has this shadow in the morning, the first time, 8 o'clock in the morning and this shadow at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, like, because that's, that was the setting that I used. Perfect. So <coughs> that's, that's what we wanted to cover with, with, the, uh, with the shadow analysis, and, and these are the tools that you can use to do yeah. that. Um, let's talk about the further details we can add to our existing uh, plan. So I think it's, it would make sense to load up another version of the family house you're all kind of familiar with, and let's see what other details we can talk about during this session. Yes. So I'm mainly thinking <coughs> of uh, let's let's see what we what we have here and what are the details that are missing. 
uh, let's, let's take a look around and see what we could do to customize this even further. So actually this building was created using the same tools. There is this uh, wall and of course the building itself, there's the plateau, you know, there's the there's these angles. We, we turn these into vertical cuts and, you and see so that on. the terrain is also <coughs> cropped in a way. So you don't, you don't need the whole thing. We just needed that particular segment. Yeah. yeah, there is a tool in the terrain local menu which allows you to make a cut and uh, represent only the uh, necessary point. And what we need here, it's uh, most of the, uh, well, now we are ver uh, focusing on the exterior. It's mostly the, 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 the staircase, staircase. Uh, from here to this level. Uh, also, uh, we will show you how you can create the gutter here, the a few external objects. And, uh, and, and I will uh, also tell you how you can create a wall like this here. So let's start with this here. So um, I show the things that were missing from our previous uh, show, but we, we figured that it would make sense to talk about this here as well. Yeah, so uh, we talked about the staircases. Uh, when you design an interior staircase or an exterior staircase, at many points they, they share the same workflow, the same uh, method. And it's actually um, the first point that you do is that you use the building stair and you pick up a shape. For until this point is the same. You select, for example, this one, you select the starting point, a break point perhaps, and the ending point. And that's again, the same thing. You, you will end up with the, with the staircase here. But this staircase won't support itself like this, not necessarily, some staircase do, but this, this uh, should have some support below, which you can design with a wall, or you can change the, the settings of the staircase. And this is what I will uh, show you now. So I select this staircase, I go to the details, and what I will change, first things first, uh, this should it's be elevated really, further. Yes. So I just need to change this a little bit uh, larger, and then I'll wait a little bit, so the software calculates the values. I can change any of these values, now I won't focus on, on them, I just keep them uh, as default. And then I change the thickness or, or, or the width of this uh, staircase to a different value because I, I don't want to see this gap here. So I just, I just uh, do that. There is the same value appearing here. And then I think uh, if it's only the, on the basic geometry, we are done. But also there is a support page here that actually allows me to elevate the staircase. Now it's at zero, so it's fine. I can also set up the waist slab. The waist slab is actually this part here. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, now 15 centimeters. That's fine for most of the, the, the concrete staircases. But in this case, I would like to really make a large body. I, I don't want to build a, a wall because this is only the sketch now, what I would like to do. So I just really use a large value here. It will be four meters and that's what I uh, use at the end. So I just hit okay and then I have that body here. Mm -hmm. Now, I think it would be nice to have the same material here than here. How so do you do that? I just right click on this uh, surface and there is this fine material. And then once the software finds that material, I just drag and drop it over this surface and I select replace uh, this material on this object. So I just click here and the software makes it uh, similar. I can of course also change the, uh, the material of the top surfaces of this staircase. And most importantly, I can also go to the settings and then I can set up the railing. And th there is a, there is a material uh, about railing, how you can design railing in, in the software. Now I will just simply use uh, the basic, the default railing uh, styles. You can also build up your own styles. But this time I will just simply go with, for example, this one. And okay. And then the software uh, creates that. Well, it's, it's, it's actually the, the wrong side. side. So I go here again, go back to the settings. And this should be, yeah, it's, it's on the uh, left hand side. So let's just go with this one again. Okay. So that's it. I can customize it. I can make changes uh, to that, and I can manually draw another one here if uh, if I want. Let's add some external elements, uh, and for that we should use one of the object libraries that Arshline currently connects to. Yeah, um, those libraries uh, are actually here. Can you tell us a little bit more about yes, these? Yes. So with the 2018 version of Arshline, <laughs> there's a few other object libraries which came to the software in addition to ones that we already have. Yeah. BIMobject.com might be familiar to you. That's the largest BIM element depository, more than uh, 800,000 registered users and millions of objects, obviously. The best thing about this uh, library in particular is that they have manufactured objects. So they have the accurate data and manufacturally guaranteed 
um, proportions and details. The other, uh, other items you see in this library are similar uh, catalogs in, in the fashion that they have manufactured items. Don't forget that we also have our own showroom, yeah. which is the, the, uh, our own depository of elements. These, uh, these are, again, manufactured objects. And yeah, those are from manufacturers who contacted us directly. Yes, yes these are <coughs> our tiles, uh, sanitary ware, openings, you name it. The list is, yeah. is very long. But what we want to show you now is the 3D warehouse connection, which I think if you already used SketchUp or you are vaguely familiar with it, you already heard about it. This is the largest online uh, catalog of user-generated uh, three-dimensional models. User-generated means that it's actually a wide variety of different items. So designers such as any of you are preparing these models and, and they are enthusiastically <coughs> uploading this, which is a very good thing as far as we are concerned, because you can find elements like this one, which is a beautifully modeled external bench. And that's what we are going to load up into our, our software. Mind you, if you are using an older version of Arch9, you have to use that version of the SketchUp model. Okay, once, you are, once you have imported, this object is now going to be part of your model. So it's going to be in your library, and you can position where these elements are. It's going to snap on the external walls. Obviously, you can change that later on if you want. That's just one example to show you how you can use external data in your model. Obviously, if you are working with user-generated models, you have to check that they are in the right size, right scaling, and they are not, uh, you know, they are actually appropriate for your purposes. Yeah, and they are not too much detailed, so that's, uh, yes. that's also an important Sometimes thing. Sometimes uh, when you are working with certain objects, they might be too large, may, might be in a different scaling, so you have to scale them down, but you already know how to do that. With the yeah, well, there's, there's another um, video about that yes. as well. How you, uh, Actually, the software will tell you that, they, that the object is too dense or, or having too many materials and then you can decide if you would like to use it or not. Uh, mostly this happens with foliage, you know, trees, bushes, and, and things like that. Uh, but it can happen with uh, decoration items as well. So you That's will right. see when, 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 you, when a, an object is uh, too much complex. Let's talk about that wall <coughs> piece up there. Oh, before that, the downspout. Yeah, let me, the let me add the downspout, because we already have two, but this part is not having any. So when you would like to add the downspout, uh, we actually create the last time in the last session, we actually did uh, show you how you can create the, the roof shape itself, but we didn't cover this part. So let me just quickly show you that it's in building, it's in the roof and it's called gutter. So what you need to pick is one of the edges. We already added one and one here. So I just picked this edge here and the software recognizes the length of that uh, edge. And then you can set up the gutter section profile, also the gutter color. You can go to the uh, libraries of, uh, of Archland and you can either use uh, predefined ones or you can also, of course, create your own materials, your own fabrics, your own colors. And then uh, once that's done, you can also set up uh, a downspout here. I will actually just move it uh, to the right a little bit and then I will just go with this path and uh, also the same, the default settings. So I just click create and then I hit OK. So what I can do then, uh, I can of course further, further customize it. If I pick the wrong position, I can just elevate it either using a number or just using, you know, any reference point of the drawing itself. And then if I also want, I can simply uh, select this part and then just uh, change its length to mm -hmm. touch the ground or make a, make a curvy ending or something like that. So this is how you can uh, work with that. And talking about this, there is another part here uh, which we should cover and that's uh, also the, it's called the 3D sweep. Uh, briefly, we talked about it. If you remember when we added the flat roof, we added a decorative profile to the edges. Yeah. We are going to use the very same uh, tool, but we are going to use it a little bit differently. We will use it to add the gas piping, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a, a gas meter here. And then what I will do, I just go back to this, this first floor where, it, uh, re where it's represented in 2D in the ground floor. And then I use this uh, 3D sweep tool, it's here. And then I start from here, from the center point, and then I add a vertical part, uh, which is done by this keyword here. And then this should be 2.6 or 2.5 or something like that. So let's just go with this one. Then I make a horizontal connection, a vertical connection to this wall, and I can use a smooth uh, arc to make it like this, just move it around. And again, an arc happens to be here. And so, so you on. just and keep on, you know, bending the, 
this profile until until you are done with uh, defining the the path. Yeah. And once you have done mm -hmm. that, you are obviously going to use the cross section that you have now, but you could change it to anything <coughs> else you want. Now I'm using a, pro, uh, a circular uh, cross section, but you can pick up any other, or you can even draw uh, the cross section. And as you can see, I used the, only used the 2D uh, drawing, and I could create a 3D uh, pipe in like this. And I say okay, and it appears in the 3D. And there's only one uh, glitch here that I didn't decide where it starts from. So it, it started from zero, but then it's easier to come here and say, I would like to change the length and touch the top uh, of this. The downspout is in the way. Uh, yeah, that's, is there any way to change that's, that? the, that's the same. It, it, it is handled in the same way. You just click on this path and you select, select Edit Downspout Path, and then you can click on uh, offset if you would like to move the downspout instead of the um, the gas piping it really depends mm -hmm. on the on the design but you can do both so and of course if you would like to make changes here because there I didn't add some um, you know uh, fillet here so what I will do I just click on the corner point and I say fillet and I just you know That's make right. it curvy Perfect. <coughs> One last thing to add here. Uh, let's look at the uh, that that wall piece up there because last time when we talked about the the roofs, we showed how the roof can cut the slabs and uh, and walls below that. But now they are not really overlapping. So how did you achieve this kind of shape? There are two ways uh, to do this. If you have a roof that is overlapping this wall, it will be automatically solved. But in this case, uh, this is a different scenario. There is no roof on top of this, this uh, wall, so it cannot be automatically cut. Uh, so you need to know how you can cut the wall layout by yourself. So for that, I actually revealed, that's the, that's the thing here, it's actually reshaped. So I delete, delete this front top profile, and this is how it originally mm -hmm. looks like. So let, let me show you how you can draw a contour for the wall by yourself. First things first, I set up a front of view of this uh, building. In this case, it's actually a, a back view like this. And then I turn this image drawing, uh, in this image representation into vector drawing. And then I just simply use a hidden line removal drawing. So that's, that's like a literal contour drawing, uh, like an elevation drawing of this uh, whole thing here. And then what I will do, I will just select this uh, drawing uh, completely Control C for copy, pick up its top point, and I go back to the 2D drawing to place it, Control V, uh, next to the building for my purposes. Okay, would you do the changes on the drawing? These are uh, lines only, so I so cannot do anything with this. If I just simply erase this here, it seems okay, but it's just a 2D, 2D drawing and, and it still did not disappear from here. So that's not how you solve it. You just uh, put this 2D copy of the current status to your drawing to be able to use it as a reference uh, to, to see what contour you need, because that's what I need. So when we talk about this wall, it's actually this wall surface on this drawing. So I need to click on the uh, proper surface which is facing me it's a uh, you, you remember it was a it was a yes. back view so back means this area it's, it's like I'm standing here and that's the back so I click here on the proper side and I select local menu profile and then I use the add whole front or profile and then that's the you know the rectangular shape of the wall itself so I just snap it to the current full mm -hmm. 3d and then I used these tools or just simply click in the corners of this drawing to be able to determine the new shape and I hit enter of this wall and see now it disappeared from the 3D as well. Let me just check that. And now I cannot rotate it. See I am I'm trying to rotate it with the shift wheel button but that's a it's a vector drawing so you cannot rotate it that way. You need to go back to image representation and perhaps let me just change it back to consistent color so we will see it much better and then I just shift wheel click rotate it mm -hmm. and then now we can see it solved perfect so that's how you can create additional shapes so the wall profile tool is something that you might have already seen but when it comes to copying the actual circumstances it's, it's better to just take an image of your 3d model and use it as an overlay yeah
that's basically what we wanted to discuss during this this part. Uh, this is how we process architectural documentation and how how we get data into the software. Next time we'll do a, do the opposite way. We are going to look at how to get data out of the system. We talk about sections, elevations, calculations, any kind of data. We will create can, those Excel files as well. Yes, yeah. that's right. So any kind of data what comes out of the, of our time would be discussed uh, during the next session, which is actually going to be on the twelfth of June. We take a short break. Yeah. And after that, we'll be back to do the remaining three shows, which will be documentation, the everyday uses of BIM, and visuals. Which visuals, will, yeah. Ran, which will be renders. That will be the mo most exciting part. So mm -hmm. thank you very much for your attention. See you on the 12th of June. And until next time. Bye See bye. you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>